Our hands, our fingers perhaps, are in the passage of Scripture tonight, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And as I read this morning, our theme verse for this year, verse number 9, states, Wherefore we labor that whether present or absent, we may be accepted of Him. And I want to tonight just go a little bit deeper into this thought of laboring or endeavoring to please the Lord. And uh, the practical aspect tonight of how we do that is really going to be the theme, and then tied in with how then the, the plan, the, the framework of that lived out this year in our church ministry. And um, I look forward to just uh, introducing a few things. Of course, we know that it's difficult to really see the future at all, uh, but I believe that we need a vision. We need some sort of a framework to go forward on, and that's my prayer and hope tonight that uh, we would see this together. The height of the world of World War II, uh, there was a preacher that was incarcerated by the Nazis in Germany. Um, he was really in prison for taking a stand against Hitler. Uh, he was a vocal opponent in his preaching and his uh, political activism in that way. A group of Christians asked him one time, um, they, they said, why do you expose yourself to all the danger that you put yourself in by being this public kind of um, opposition to what you see as wrong or evil. And uh, if, if uh, he, they said, if Jesus returns any day, then all of your work will be in vain anyway. In other words, they were saying, the time of Jesus' coming seems to be close at hand. Now, granted, this was almost 80 years ago, and um, or a little, yeah, about 80 years ago or so, and you know, they thought that Jesus' coming was close then. Uh, now, 80 years in the scope of God's timing is nothing. Uh, as, as humans, that's a lifetime, and so we understand that uh, what their perspective was way back then. He, he answered and said, if Jesus comes tomorrow, then tomorrow I'll rest from my labor. But today I have work to do. I must continue the struggle until it is finished. And I think that's the spirit that I desire, not only for my life, but for our church as we go forward. Yes, Jesus' is coming is imminent. And I would say tonight that it would be so easy for us as humans to just stop and say, well, the Lord's coming anytime. What does it matter if we do just a little more? What does it matter if we give ourselves just a little more, if we put ourselves out there and really expend ourselves? Why do we want to go forward with things when we know that Jesus is coming so soon? Why not just hold on? Why not just coast into the final, uh, the, the, uh, the end zone there, or whatever the case might be, and just cross the finish line coasting? And I know in our flesh that sounds very good. But I would reflect maybe that answer that we heard tonight. If Jesus comes tomorrow, tomorrow's the day of rest. Today is the day of labor and work. And so I say that going forward tonight in our hope and in our vision for what the Lord can do. I don't want this to be a year where we sit back and coast. I don't want it to be a year where we just kind of give up more and, and kind of step back more. I want it to be a year when we can take a step forward and we can reclaim more ground for the Lord. That's my burden. That's our hope and my prayer as we go forward. Uh, Winston Churchill was the um, prime minister. And again, England, during this, of increasing their coal production, and he called together the labor leaders to enlist their support to help prompt a greater coal production that they needed for the war effort. At the end of the presentation, he asked them to picture in their minds what it would look like as the parade of victors would walk, walk through Piccadilly Circus there in England, London. And he said, first would come the sailors who had kept the vital sea lanes open and allowed for the supply lines to be clear and open. And then would come the um, soldiers on the ground who had come home from Dunkirk and then they had been sent back out to defeat Rommel in Africa. And, and they would come marching through in victory and boy it would be a wonderful time. Then would come the pilots who drove off the Luftwaffe and they, they helped keep um, England free in the, in the skies. And last of all he said would come the long line of sweat-stained, soot-streaked men in their miners' caps 
Someone would cry from the crowd, why were you, uh, excuse me, where were you during the critical, critical days of our struggle? And from the thousands of throats that would ring, they would say, we were deep in the earth with our faces to the coal, bringing out what's needed for the war effort. Now, what, what he was trying to say was, there are many times when we feel like what we're doing may seem insignificant. It may seem insignificant in the scope of eternity to make sure that the church is clean for Sunday morning. It may seem insignificant for us to drive a van out on Saturday and pick up a handful of kids and bring them in so that they can hear the gospel. It may seem insignificant that we knock on doors and we don't have any grand revelations. Nobody's falling on their face begging, what must I do to be saved? But I'm telling you tonight that what we do for the Lord is worth doing. And whether it's big or small, may God help us to understand the value of what we're doing tonight and what we're doing this week. And so I tell you that what we do for the Lord is extremely important. And we don't need to be looking back. We don't need to be setting down. We don't need to be going backwards. We need to be going forward and taking the ground that God would have us to take. Now, I have two very simple thoughts tonight. And I want to just, if I can, go through this passage with these two thoughts in mind. The second one really then allows me to introduce a lot of things of what we're going to be looking at, the things that we're going to be looking at this year. And so the motive, first of all, I want you to see uh, why we labor for the Lord. Verse number 9 tells us that whether we labor, wherefore we labor, that whether present or absent, we may be accepted of Him. I went through all of the definitions this morning. I'm not going to take time to do that tonight. I assume you understand what we mean by labor and by, by this idea of being accepted of the Lord. The idea tonight is that we have a motive then for what we're doing. And tonight I find that there are three motives why we need to labor for the Lord given to us in this passage. But before I give you that tonight, I want you to remember 1 Corinthians 15, 58. It's become one of my favorite verses. If you know it, you can say it with me. Well, therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Now, I understand tonight that the idea of ambition sometimes can be attributed to selfish motives. And I'll tell you, there's a very easy path for us to get on selfish motives when it comes to ambition. And I tell you, we sing songs about keeping ambition and pride checked in our lives. But I want to just differentiate tonight, if I can, between selfish ambition, that is the ambition that I would want to promote myself and to make myself greater, or to make my plans greater, magnify that which I desire, and the ambition that I believe we find here in the book of 2 Corinthians that is a holy ambition. Now, what is the difference? Well, one seeks only God's glory and His good, and one seeks self-glory and self-good. So, I tell you tonight that there is an ambition that is a godly ambition that makes us yearn for the right way and please our Savior. That's what we talked about, didn't we, this morning? The idea of, of this earnest zeal and passion, that's what the word labor means. It means to be earnest in our passion and zeal to be accepted or well-pleasing to the Lord. And so this holy ambition that honors the Lord and seeks His way of living is what we ought to uh, really shoot for tonight. And so I give you number one, the first motive tonight, because we're, we want to please the Lord. We want to labor to please the Lord. Why? Well, the first one is this idea of the ambition, the desire to please God. Why do we labor? Why are we going to add things this year? Pastor, why don't we just step back a little bit? We don't know what's going on. We don't understand what's going to happen. I mean, you've got the, the COVID and you've got um, uh, the, the, the pandemic that we talk about. Then you've got the political problems and you've got the economic problems and you've got all of these things going on. Pastor, why don't we just step back a little bit? And the reason I say tonight is that we don't step back, we step forward, is because of the ambition that we have to please our Savior. I want to just encourage you tonight that you would find that same ambition in your heart. Oh, it's not an ambition to lift ourselves up. It's an ambition to say, Lord, I want your will to be done, and I want to stand before you one day, and I want to say, well done. I want to hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Now, church, that's what we are looking for tonight. God and His pleasure in our life to be revealed. Now, what is it then that reveals God's pleasure? And He, he has given that um, to us. Let me just give you a couple of these. Turn over to Ephesians chapter 5. Let's do 
just kind of a discovery of these passages tonight. Can we do that? Use your hands and your eyeballs, and let's turn to Ephesians chapter 5, all right? You might swipe to Ephesians 5, whatever, whatever is the right verb there, just whatever, whatever you're using, all right? Ephesians chapter 5, I want you to look at it, though. Okay, now notice, if you will, um, I, I'm going to pick up in verse number um, 3. But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not be once named among you as become a saints, neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor jesting, which are not convenient, but rather giving of thanks. For this we know that no whoremonger, nor unclean person, nor covetous man, who is an idolater, hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no man deceive you with vain words, for because of these things cometh the wrath of God on the, upon the children of disobedience. Look at verse 7. Be, ye not, uh, be not ye therefore partakers with them, for ye were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth. And look at verse number 10. Proving, let's read that together. Proving what is acceptable. Now that same word acceptable there is this word that we use in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. It is the word well-pleasing or approved. So what I'm telling you tonight is that the first way that we bring pleasure to our Savior is when we separate from the sin that is around us. Did you see all that? The Bible says, all of these things that are named, let it not be once named among you. Rather, let us prove what is acceptable unto the Lord. Now, church, may I just tell you tonight, the rubber meets the road. We made our commitment this morning, Lord willing, in our hearts to say, Lord, we want to labor to be accepted of you. We want to labor to be well-pleasing to you when we see you, whether absent or present. And so if we say, that's what I want to do, Lord, then here's how we practically do it. You have to, com you have to um, separate yourself from the corruption, the wickedness of the world around you. What is it that you allow in your life? What is it that there is in our life that keeps us from that purity of spirit and conscience that doesn't allow us to get close to the Savior and to see Him? Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. I tell you tonight, we need to be in the mindset of separating from the world. That's what pleases God, proving what is acceptable unto the Lord. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this tonight, but I think we've got weak Christianity. And I find myself being weak in my Christianity when I allow the corruption of the world to sneak in. That is the thrills and all of the things that come about that would distract me from my Savior. I'm not talking about the diversions once in a while. I'm not talking about the things that we might uh, enjoy together as, as frivolity, we might say. But what I'm talking about are those things that draw our heart away, that actually cause us to become polluted. What you're looking at, what you're thinking about, what you're seeing and hearing and talking to and talking about and all of the things that come along. Remember, the Bible says it's not what's on the outside of man that goes into him that defiles him. It's what comes out of the man, because out of the heart, the mouth speaketh. Out of the heart of the issues of life, what is it that is in your heart tonight that is not right, that's keeping you from being clean before the Lord? Because if we want to be approved of the Lord, we want to stand before Him one day and hear, well done, and see a smile on His face, then we need to be clean in this world. Separate from the sin of this world. But number two, would you turn over to Romans chapter 12? You probably know this by heart. And uh, the Bible Verse is very familiar to us, but notice in Romans 12, the Bible says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, you present your bodies a living sacrifice. Then it says, holy. And what's that next word of verse number one? Acceptable. Acceptable. There it is again. Well-pleasing unto the Lord. You want to please the Lord tonight? Number one, you say, Lord, what I've been doing, what I've been thinking about, what I've been enjoying, I realize is wrong. Now, don't get me wrong. God doesn't just want to take away all of our enjoyment. On the contrary, God wants to help us to enjoy things in the right way. But here's what he's saying. You're only going to be acceptable to me when you present your bodies a living sacrifice. We've talked about this over and over again. I've preached about the need for us to come to a place where we just surrender to the Lord. Lord, I want you to have my life. I want you to have my heart. 
You can have my mind. You can have every part of me, Lord. I may be doing something other than serving you in a full-time capacity as a career, but I, you have my full thoughts and mind and heart and body. You've got everything, Lord. You can have it. We've got to come to that place in our life. By the way, that's a very simple thing, isn't it? These things aren't hard. I mean, they may be hard to live out in practice, but they're not hard to consider and really not hard to implement with the power of the Lord. Lord, here you can have all of me. It just it just demands a choice. Proving what is acceptable unto the Lord. Present your bodies a holy a sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto the Lord. These are what God is pleased with as we do them. So our godly ambition of pleasing the Lord is carried out when we separate from sin. We present our bodies a living sacrifice to Him. And notice if you would, you're in Romans 12. Would you go to Romans 14? And look at verse number 18. I, I won't um, go back and read the context. I'll explain that in just a minute. But I think you're starting to see the pattern here. What, what word are you looking for in the verse here? <laughs> Acceptable, all right? It's not hard. Notice in verse number 18. For he that in these things serveth Christ is acceptable, well-pleasing to God, and approved, that's another word, acceptable, well-pleasing to men. Now, what are all these things that he's talking about? Well, that's where you have to go back in the context and find out. If you notice, it here is talking about not causing, are you listening? Not causing another brother to stumble into sin or to stumble in their faith. That's what it's talking about. So Paul's saying, listen, if it's important not to cause other people to stumble, here's why. Because when we do that, when we keep ourselves from being a stumbling block, we are well-pleasing to the Lord. We are acceptable to Him. Now, would you just take a moment in your life, would you look through and would you say to yourself, is there something in my life that may be causing someone else to stumble? Something of my sin, what is it that it's in my life, my actions, my attitudes that cause someone else to stumble? Young people, you may be looking around saying, I'm my own person, I'm going to do what I want to do, but yet you don't realize that there are people that are watching you and there are younger people that are watching you and you may cause to stumble. You say, that's not fair, I want to be my own person, I want to live my own life, I don't want to be responsible for anybody else. And I'm telling you tonight as carefully, carefully as I can and as lovingly as I can, that's not the way life works. You and I are not an island to ourselves. We don't get the privilege of living with our own consequences. We affect others around us. And as we want to please the Lord, we must keep in consideration the fact that we must not become a stumbling block to others. You say, does that mean I've got to give up something that I like? Maybe it's not sin. And, and the answer may be if it stumbles, causes someone to stumble, we need to be willing to give it up. Right? I don't like that. I understand. But the fact of the matter is, do we want to please self or do we want to please God? Do we want God to be the one who is pleased with us? Or we get to heaven, we could say, well, I was pleased with myself. That's not going to do anything for eternity. And so number four, let's go there if we can to Colossians chapter three. I mentioned this this morning. Matter of fact, don't turn there because we read it this morning. I'll just quote it to you again. Colossians 3.20. Does any children have that memorized? Children, honor your parents in all things. Why? For this is well-pleasing unto the Lord. Now there it's the word well-pleasing instead of acceptable. Same thing. Now, you say, are you preaching to the kids tonight? Yeah, kind of, but I, I'll say it to the adults too. I think as long as you have parents, you need to honor them. Kids, I think it's especially important for you because these are the times when you're learning how to honor your parents, not just obey, not just do what they said, but to honor them. That's not an action, that's an attitude. That means I'm not going to talk bad about them. I'm not going to think bad about them. I'm not going to disobey behind their back. I'm not going to go and do something I know is wrong when I shouldn't be doing this. I'm going to be open and honest with them. You say, why do I want to do that? It's my own life. And I'm saying, if you want to please God, this is what you need to do. God makes it very clear. This is acceptable. This is what's well-pleasing to me. Children, honor your parents in all things. Now, the Bible isn't difficult. That's not hard. But I believe this is something we need to make a choice in. Notice one more, if you would. Turn to Hebrews chapter 13. Again, we're studying ways that we can be well-pleasing to the Lord. This is our motive. We, we, we labor, why? So that we can be well-pleasing. Well, then what is well-pleasing? And we're going through this list tonight, hoping to give you some clarity on this. Hebrews, if you would, and verse, uh, let's go to chapter 13 and look at verse 20.
Now the God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect in every good work. Now the word perfect again there, don't misunderstand. I try to give it to you every time we come to it, but the word perfect means complete or mature. It doesn't mean without sin or fault. It just means grown up. All right? And so make you grown up or perfect in every good work to do His will. So what's the, before we go any further, church, what is the definition of a mature Christian? Can you see that in verse number? What is it? To do His will. That's right. To just, Lord, I want to do Your will, and uh, you do it. Now, again, that's not complicated, is it? That's not something that takes a, a doctoral um, degree in order to figure out. I want to please the Lord. Um, the will of God is for Him to make us perfect. And so this is what we're talking about tonight. The good work here that He's talking about is to do His work. The maturity that we have in a, in a um, Christian life is measured not by how long you've been saved or how much money you give or um, how many hours of service you put in. It's measured how much you do His will. All right? So I'm telling you tonight, someone that's been saved for 36 or 48 hours can almost be more mature in their Christian faith than someone who's been saved 36 years. Now that would be sad if that was the case, but it could happen. Now they may not have as much knowledge, they might have not, uh, as much experience, but they might have as much maturity. How many of you know that there could be a mature 12-year-old and a very immature 30-year-old. Okay, it's physics, uh, physical is no different than spiritual. Here's what I'm saying tonight. Maturity, then, is measured by how much we do God's will. And I believe God wants us to grow up in Him in all things. Doing the will of God is the mark of maturity. Notice, we'll continue on there. The Bible says, working in you. I'm in verse 21. The word working there is um, an emphasized word. It's a word that means to do his pleasure in you, uh, that which is well-pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ. Now, here's what I'm talking about. I'm not, this aspect of being well-pleasing to the Lord is when we allow him, hear me out, when we allow him to do his work in our lives that he's trying to do. All right, so here's the illustration. I'm going through a deep physical problem, difficulty. I don't want to go through this difficulty. I don't deserve this. I don't think I want to do this. So I'm going to do everything I can to try to get out from underneath it. And uh, again, or I'm going to be grouchy, or I'm going to be complaining, or whatever the case might be. How many of you understand tonight that God doesn't always make things come into our life? Sometimes things happen to us, but God always uses things in our life to accomplish His will. There's a, there's a difference. So here's what I'm saying. How many times do we allow Him to teach us those things when we're in that trial or how many times do we try to press against that, and push out of it, and we miss the point of all that we're going through? That happens so often. That's why we're in school so long. It takes us so long to pass the test. I, I don't know what you're going through right now, but here's what I know. God wants to do something. He wants to produce some fruit in your life, and He can only do that as you allow Him to do it. And you know what? When you allow Him to do it, it's well-pleasing to Him. He's, he's pleased when we do that. Lord, what do you want me to learn through this? Teach me what you want me to learn. I think it might be patience or it might be long-suffering. Uh, it might be something about my uh, mindset of trusting in you or uh, doubting or it might be fearful or it might be uh, uncertainty or self uh, kind of promotion or self-dependence or, or whatever it might be. Lord, teach me what you're trying to teach me through this. Maybe I'm proud and you need to humble me. I laugh sometimes because... Um, you know, I, I'm speaking and sometimes I misspo sp misspeak and say things, you know, wrong and all this. And we jo joke and laugh and, you know, sit around on Sunday and my kids make sure I know what I've done wrong. And I, I make a big deal about that. They don't do it all the time. But the fact is that it's kind of funny. And, and I could get angry about that. And you don't, you don't need to be criticizing me. But, you know, a long time ago, I just learned, you know, this may be the Lord's way of just keeping me humble. I, I don't, I mean, I... And if it is, praise the Lord. So, you know, we laugh and have a good time, and I just kind of brush it off and say, you know what, I, I make, make a lot of mistakes. I, here's what I'm saying tonight. I, I know that in those things, the challenge is, because it happens every time for my flesh to bristle, but then I have to just surrender and say, Lord, what do you want me to learn in this? Now, that's a silly illustration, 
personally, but what is it that God's doing in your life? And sometimes those things can have big consequences. Um, being able to trust Him and learning to trust Him with our life's direction. Young people, what, it, what is God going to use you to do? What are you going to be doing in your life? Well, those are big deals. Are you, and you're in the middle of it. I don't want to make this choice. I don't want to be forced into this. And I don't know what I'm going to do. And it's just frustrating. And God's bringing you to a brick wall so He can teach you to trust Him. And He's going to deliver if you just be patient and wait and watch. And so all of these things that we go through in our life are for a purpose. And the Bible says He makes us perfect in every good work, mature in every good work to do His will, working in you that which is well-pleasing in His sight. And so the Bible is very clear tonight on these areas. There are many others we could talk about, I'm sure. But I've given you five tonight. Lord, I want to be well-pleasing to you. I want to stand before you and be accepted. What do I do? I've given you five areas tonight where I think you can begin. I believe there's others. But tonight you can start on those. And I believe those will be great ways for us to show the Lord that we mean business in this. So the godly ambition, first of all, is the first motive. But notice the second motive here, and I'm not going to spend nearly as much time on these. But I've, I mentioned this already, but if you go back to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, I think another motive is the judgment seat of Christ. We mentioned that this morning, and I'm not going to go all through it tonight, but we, we might say that not every believer is ambitious for the Lord. They're not all going to be gung-ho and running it all out for the Lord. Matter of fact, I know a lot of Christians that are backing up and saying, I'm, I'm going to back up for the Lord. <laughs> I'm going to sit down for the Lord. Uh, I'm going to you know, close my doors for the Lord or whatever. But I believe, as we've learned this morning, we need to be ambitious for the Lord. And that's where we find sometimes the decision point in our life. So not every believer is going to be ambitious for the Lord, but as we know from the Scripture, every believer is going to stand before the Lord. Did you read that in verse number 10? For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. So I'll just say tonight, the decision to whether you're going to be ambitious and labor for the Lord to be well-pleasing, or whether you're going to sit back and kind of relax or retire a little bit, be safe, is your decision. But the fact of the matter is, we're all going to stand before the Lord. How many understand tonight that's a pretty impressive motive to do something for the Lord? Um, I won't use any comparisons, although we could find many, but the fact is, we're going to stand before the Lord, and now's the time to prepare for it. Can I say that again? We're going to stand before the Lord. Now's the time to prepare for it. What are you doing right now to prepare to stand before the Lord? Again, I mentioned this morning, we're not going to stand before Him and give account for our sin, but we will give account for those things that we've done in our body, whether they're good, that is profitable, or bad, that is worthless. Same meaning. Paul was ambitious for the Lord because he wanted to stand before Him with confidence and not with shame. And as a, as a, I, I'm, I know it's easy for me standing here to preach and to say this, but it, I believe it's truly in my heart. When I stand before the Lord, I want to stand before Him and not stand before Him with shame. Now, I have to say right now, if the Lord were to come back this moment, I could already think of ways where I failed to be ambitious enough for the Lord. And that gives me a lot of motivation to say, tomorrow morning, I'm going to get up and I'm going to do something for the Lord. I want to labor for Him that I might be accepted. Tonight, before I go to bed, what can I do to make it count for eternity? You see, I don't think that's superfluous to think that way. I think every moment that we have is valuable. That's why the Bible says, so teach us to number our days. Why? So that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. I just believe tonight that it's that important. And I think tonight that our time is short. I really do. Now, I know that the Thessalonians thought that, and I know the people back in World War II thought that. But here I am in 2021, and I really do think that. <laughs> I think the Lord's coming back soon. But even if he's not, even if he doesn't come back for another hundred years, my life here is uncertain. I don't know how much longer I'm going to have. Today may be my last day on this earth. I hope not. Uh, it may be my last year, 2021, may be the last year that I see on this earth. If it is, what am I doing now to prepare for it? So we've got two motives. The coming of the Lord, or my demise, both cases, at some point, I'm going to stand before the Lord and give an account for my works. The judgment seat, I believe, will be a place of four things. Number one, I'll just give these to you quickly before I go on. The judgment seat will be a place of revelation. We must all appear before Christ. The word appear there means to be revealed. I don't necessarily think it's like we're going to be like, ta-da, you know, I'm here, and 
poof of smoke, you know, whatever. I think what it means is we're coming before him and we, we're going to have everything laid open before us. That's what the Bible talks about in 1 Corinthians where it says our works will be tried with fire, the, God, the gaze of God. So here's the point. The idea there is that <clears throat> we get to heaven, what we're doing, what we've done will be revealed. Now, it's like, um, I don't know, maybe you've been in class before and uh, the teacher calls on you to stand up and write the problem that you wrote for homework on the board while everybody's watching. You know the, you know the drill, right? Or you have to stand and quote something or whatever the case might be and you're called on in front of everybody to reveal what you've done. <sighs> I hope I did it right. I can't remember. Palms get sweaty, all right? Okay, so you take that and, and again, you just kind of multiply that feeling a thousand times and that's probably what we're gonna feel like before the Lord. Opening up, Lord, I, I'm not talking about this matter of uncertainty. I'm just saying the, the fear um, or maybe the, the idea of, of inadequacy will reign, I believe, there. And the, the desire to see God be glorified in our lives. If you could just plant yourself there for a minute, get a vision for what that's going to feel like, I believe it'll help motivate us. So it's a place of revelation. Number two, it's a place of reckoning. We'll give an account, as I already mentioned. And... Um, uh, it's not just we'll make an excuse. We've got to account for it. Either it's going to be profitable or unprofitable. There's no middle ground. It's not going to be, well, we'll let this one pass or whatever. It's profitable or unprofitable. Number three, it'll be a place of reward. Notice the Bible says that every man may receive the things done in his body. Literally, with his body, the temple that God's given to us. What have you done with it? And so it'll be a place of reward. And then number four, it'll be a place of rejoicing. We find out other places I mentioned this morning that those rewards that we get will be really cast at, at Christ's feet. And uh, I, I, I can't begin to explain how marvelous that will be. So we find the first motive is the motive of ambition to be well-pleasing. Number two motive is the judgment seat of Christ. But number three is something I preached on last week, I think, and that's found in verse number 14. The love of Christ constraineth us. And I'm not going to preach that message again, but I think it's worth noting in context of being well-pleasing, why do we do all this? And I, it's not, again, selfish ambition, human aspiration, nothing about that. It is, what is it? The love of Christ that constrains us. Everything we do as a Christian ought to be because Christ loved us and gave himself for us. And my life is a complete sacrifice for him because of what he's done for you and I. Church, that really becomes the bottom line. I think not only is that the last on our list, but I think it's the first in our motive. The Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 that the greatest of all these things that he listed is love, charity. It's what we do. If I serve and I don't have charity, it's valueless. If I speak and I don't have love, it's empty. If I sacrifice my body and I don't have love, it doesn't mean a thing. But with love, all of those things bring value to my Christian life. It's the love that I have for my Savior that really brings value to us. So tonight I see three reasons why we need to labor this year to be pleasing to the Lord. Number one... Our ambition to hear him say, well done, now good and faithful servant. Number two, we're going to all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Number three, we love Christ with our whole heart and mind and soul. I'll tell you tonight, I can't think of any three stronger motives to do anything for the Lord. Can you? Amen. Let me move to this point then very practically as we close, and that is the methods then. What are we going to do about this? So this really then becomes... The, the blueprint for us going forward. Now, I'll tell you this. There are no new goals in the Christian life. Christ set the goal back when he left. All right? So we're not making any new goals. What there can be are new opportunities, and there might be new strategies, new means by which we can meet those goals. All right? So we've had uh, some challenges this year. We had to go to online viewing, by which everybody listening online, thank you. God bless you, you're the recipient of many hours of work. I'll have you say that tonight, or know that tonight. But here's the point. It has, in, 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 I think, enlarged our ministry opportunity. Now, it's not visible. I don't think it's necessarily the, the key. But I'll tell you this. 
that, that there are people listening online that would, cannot or would not enter into our church. Now, I'm not, I, I, that's, take it for what it is. It is what it is, but I think God can use it. I'm just saying tonight that we have opportunities now that we, don't have, we haven't had before. So that's just one illustration. The goal, then, is always to minister the gospel to the lost and dying world. That's the goal. All right, Matthew 28, 19 and 20, the last words of Christ, our greatest command, as we've heard before. So the goal is to minister this gospel to the Lord Jesus. So in keeping with that commission and in view of commitment that we've made to labor to be well-pleasing to Him, I want to just, if, if I can, talk about several new ministry opportunities this year that I believe will be a help. And I believe no, by no means is this an exhaustive list because I think that there are other things that could become available as we go. So number one, I want you to see that there is a laboring and witness that we're going to have. Would you go to that first uh, launch slide, please, if you would. I am super excited because uh, every even Wednesday of the calendar year, we are going to have team soul winning. And I'm excited to launch this in the month of February where we're going to invite young people to come in. Now, I say teens because that's going to be the focus. Anybody that wants to could come, all right? We're going to meet at 4.30 on the even-numbered Wednesdays, all right, starting in February. So every other week, we're going to start in February, and at 4.30, we're going to meet together. We'll have a short meeting. We're going to organize. We're going to go out into a, a location. We're going to hand out tracks. We're going to knock on doors. We may be doing it in a public place uh, downtown. We may be going through some places here in in um, Broadview Heights uh, or our surrounding communities, but just blanketing our community with the gospel and witnessing and inviting and encouraging people to come in. I'm super excited about this. And then we're going to come back and we're going to enjoy a meal together before the service. And a uh, meal will be about 6.15 or 6.20, and we'll eat a meal and get cleaned up. Just as people are walking in, they can smell all that lovely food that we've been eating and be all jealous for us, all right? So here's what I'm saying tonight. The, the young people, I want to invite you, I want to implore you that in this day that we're living in, this is an opportunity for us to take a step of faith and say, instead of stepping back, we're going to step forward, and we want to use what we have, our energy, our zeal, and our desire to serve the Lord to see God do things. And I'm going to tell you, I believe, I believe that we are going to see some miracles happen through this, this ministry this year. I've been praying about it. I believe God specifically directed me in this, um, and I'll tell you how. I was uh, praying about, Lord, what, what can we do this year? And I was sitting down here listening to a preacher preach. I can't remember which it was, one of our guest speakers this year. And God just struck me with that thought, you need to make another opportunity for soul winning. And it needs to be for our young people. They're serving on Saturday. They're doing a great job. And I appreciate all of the work. And I think uh, we could include many others. But the fact is, I think this is something that we need to do. And I'll tell you, I heard then that a couple of our young men were praying about doing that very same thing. And I didn't even know about that. And God put those things together. Isn't that exciting? That's not insignificant. I think that's an important thing. God's going to do something through that. Now, it's going to take some requirement or some um, uh, input from the church. Uh, I'm going to I'm going to ask ladies and men, families, if they would sign up to provide a meal every other week, so, so often, however you can do it, whatever, and uh, have it here for the young people to eat when they get back from visitation. I'm going to ask you to do that. Um, I think it would be great if I had some adults to go with them and to help them out, kind of guide them a little bit and uh, train or whatever and uh, be a part of that. I think it would be awesome um, if we could do something like that. So this, I think, is very important as we go forward. Of course, we're going to continue our Saturday morning visitation at 10 o'clock. I've been thankful for the work going on there. We make visits. We go door to door, uh, knocking on doors. We've met people. We've encouraged people. And we've been able to give the gospel out numerous times in the form of tracts and a verbal witness, and I'm thankful for that going on. That will not cease. We'll continue that every Saturday at 10 o'clock. And so we've got Teen Soul Winning every even Wednesday starting in February, and then we've got our outreach opportunities on Saturday mornings at 10 o'clock. Now, I appreciate other people say, Pastor, I can't go on Saturdays. Can I go out another day of the week? Absolutely. And uh, trying to continue that and keep it going. I appreciate that spirit very much. I, there's no magic time, but I think unless we plan, we're not going to do it. And this is where I want to have the structure to take into that. So, number one, we're laboring in witness uh, this year, and I'm thankful for that. Number two, I, I, we're going to be laboring in the Word. Now, before you go to another slide there, guys, just a second. Um, I'm thankful for all of the people this year that read through their Bible, at least made an effort to read their Bible every day. Can I say thank the Lord for you? And we strove together this year that we were going to read the Bible 
every day, and we recognize people on the board, and I didn't make a big deal about it reading their names in church or anything, but I'm thankful for that. Now, here's what I want to do. If you have read your Bible all the way through, um, I think Mrs. Zerby has that information. We'll try to figure it out. But if you have, I'd like to reward you for that. All right? Now, you'd say, I mean, I didn't think there was a reward in the Bible for reading your Bible all the way through or reading it every day. There's really not. But I think that's something that we need to do. And I think I promised that, that last year anyway. So uh, we're going we're gonna to be offering some things for you to choose if you've made that your commitment through the year and you've been faithful to that. I appreciate it very much. But we're going to continue that. All right, so keep on keeping on. The Bible is a, the biggest aspect of our life, and drawing from that is so important. And so uh, Bible reading continues this year. And I'm looking forward this year again to uh, implementing again uh, two tracks for Bible memory. And I'm looking forward. Mrs. Zerby said, oh, no. <laughs> but I think we have, some, we have some strategy going forward, and I'm thankful for the willingness that we have of memorizing the Word of God. And I want to just encourage you again. Maybe you've never done this. Maybe you've done it and failed. Uh, maybe you did it and succeeded. Whatever the case, don't make an excuse. Let's jump back in and, and memorize the Scripture one more time. And so there's going to be two tracks. We're going to do a spring track, and then we'll do a fall track as well. And I'm excited about uh, doing those things. And we're going to be having again in the fall our eight weeks of Institute series, uh, and I'm, I'm looking forward to this opportunity once again. We'll have three new tracks or four new tracks or however many it's going to be, but it'll be for eight weeks. Last fall we went for ten. We got interrupted a little bit, uh, but we've got it planned out, Lord willing, and we're going to go eight consecutive weeks that will go from September the 1st until October the 20th, and we'll be done just in time for what I'm going to talk about next, but that Fall Institute series is going to be a great time on Wednesday nights where we allow God to speak to us, and we grow in certain areas of our Christian life very specifically. All right, so lay bring in the Word. Number one, reading. Number two, memory. Number three, we talked about the Fall Institute series. Then I want to talk about, if we can, two special preaching opportunities and special emphasis opportunities this, this year. Number one is our preaching conference in May, and that is uh, we're going to be having Dr. Jim Van Geldren. Now, he's an evangelist that travels around uh, f uh, the, the country and preaching. He's going to be here with us from Sunday, May the second, all the way until Friday, May the seventh. Now, this is the first time in a long time that we've had a, a full week of services, and I think this is going to be something that's going to really change us. It's going to be something that we're going to be encouraged by, and I've called it a preaching conference because it really is uh, in place of our annual family conference. I'm changing the, the theme a little bit this year because I think there's some issues that we're going to deal with during that week that will be pivotal for each one of us. And so I'm asking you right now just to commit to be here, be in your place. We're going to be praying about it. We're going to be excited about what God's going to do because we're expecting Him to do these things through prayer. And so that will be May 2nd through the 7th uh, each night of that week. Then the second opportunity for special meetings is uh, going to be Evangelist Randy King. How many remember Dr. King? Dr. King was here with us one service um, about two years ago, and he made quite an impact in your life, I'm sure, all right? Uh, but Dr. King has uh, been a great friend of mine um, through the years. He's been retired now from the uh, church that he pastored in Wildwood Baptist Church. This is where Bearing Precious Seed is up in Wisconsin. And um, this is uh, really a... Uh, uh, an icon, I believe, in uh, Christianity today. He's just down-home country farmer, but a God-called preacher, and he just has a plain way of saying it that no one else can do. <laughs> All right, And so Dr. King will be with us between October 28th, which is a Thursday night. He'll be here Thursday night, Friday night, Saturday, and Sunday, the 31st in October. And um, I, I, again, believe this can be pivotal in our church and I think this is the first time, at least that I can remember, we've had two special meetings in one year. And I believe this is something that we can do f going forward. I think it's necessary, and the more that we can do it, the better. I don't want to overwhelm our schedule, but this is going to be uh, very important for us. And so we're laboring in witness, as I mentioned. We're laboring in the Word. Um, and then, <clears throat> lastly, if I could just talk about a few uh, incremental things, uh, incidental things, excuse me, um, things that we're going to be implementing again this year uh, by faith, trusting that we'll be able to do it. One of these things is our adve Adventure Bible Camps. You remember that anti antiquated idea that we had last year, right? Uh, we tried, didn't we? And uh, COVID put a squash on all of that, and we weren't able to do it. We had the plans last year to make this the biggest 
Adventure Bible Camp that we've ever had. And, of course, that went down in flames with all of the other changes that went on. Now, I'm thankful for the opportunity to do certain things. And I believe as we launch out this year, I'm not putting any kind of expectation on the size. But I'm, we're going to do this the best that we possibly can and trust the Lord for it. I have no idea what it's going to look like when we get there. But this Adventure Bible Camp is going to be something that I know God can use in a great way. And we're going to use it as an outreach, uh, as well as children in our church. But we're going to be inviting folks in kids in to this, uh, to our, from our community and other places to be a part of that. And again, that's going to take a lot of work, a lot of planning. A lot of planning has already been done because we had it planned for last year, but uh, we're going to go forward with that. Um, also, team camp this year, we're looking forward to that, teens. That'll be in July, and uh, we're looking forward to taking a group of um, teens to camp again and, and trusting that God would work in our lives in that way. And then as we labor in discipleship, the Adventure Bible Camp and the team camp, I just want to make us a word, if I can, about our adult Bible fellowships. Uh, I believe the number one tool of discipleship in our church is the tool of, advent, uh, of our um, adult Bible fellowships that we've had. And uh, don't underestimate the work that God's doing in the hearts and lives of people each week in those groups. And I believe it's going to be revolutionary as more and more people catch that vision for what God can do and what that flavor, that spirit of this whole thing is, uh, it becomes a vital role in the discipleship. And I'm looking forward to God expanding that, using it in His, uh, in his will and His service this year. Now, pray with me if you would, because each one of these requires leaders. And the goal is to develop leaders within each of those Bible fellowships to be able to multiply that Bible fellowship into another one. And so I'm praying that God would do that. Pray that God would help us to be able to expand in that and uh, see His Word accomplished in lives. And so we labor in discipleship this year, and I'm excited about that. Of course, we go forward with all regular services, right? We're going to be here every service, trusting God and moving in our midst, and I'm thankful for that also. Now, so we've been strategizing, Brother Perkins and I, about what we're going to do with choir and, you know, kids' choir and all these things. Those announcements are going to come very soon, and I'm looking forward to what God will use. I don't want to just, we we're very careful not to just reinstate things just for the sake of doing it, we want to identify and, and assess each part of our ministry and go forward purposefully. And so that's really what we're doing. We're taking our time on that, making sure we get it right. And I'm excited what the Lord will do in those coming years as well. And that may um, include um, moving the time of the service in just a little bit. I've been praying about that, giving us a little more opportunity before and after the service for things. And so i um, praying through those, but we'll make those announcements as they become available. Let me close tonight, if I can, with this thought, and then we're going to be done. There was a preacher recently that um, he said, you know, I've talked to people, I talked to a pastor, and he said, uh, you know, soul winning just doesn't work. Witnessing to people doesn't work anymore. Um, and basically, he, the pastor said, I, I think I'm just going to become kind of Calvinistic, and we're just going to, I've been reading about Reformed theology, and I think that's really the way to go, and, and this preacher friend of mine, he said to the pastor, he said, okay, just hold on a second. Let me ask you three questions before you do this. He said, number one, in your church, can you tell me, Paul, Paul in the New Testament, he said, pray that a door of utterance would be open for me, that I may be able to preach the gospel with all boldness. He says, would you name for me one person in your church, just name anybody in your church, who before they get out of bed in the morning, before they eat their breakfast or before they walk out the door, will breathe a prayer that says, Lord, would you give me utterance today that I may preach the gospel with all boldness? Would you give me anybody in your church? The pastor thought for a minute, he thought, I, I can't think of anybody that would pray that prayer. And we're talking about a pastor who pastored a church of 100 adults or more. He said, I can't think of anybody who would do that. He said, I want to give you number two question. He said, um, how many pr people in your church, let's just say and take for granted that somebody comes and they fall on their face and they scream out, what must I do to be saved? Is there anybody in your church who would have a track or a John Romans or a Bible close at hand, something that they could reach in a moment's notice to put in the hand of that person in order to give them that gospel message? And the guy thought for a little bit, he thought, hmm, I think there's a little old lady that carries around tracks in her purse. But I can't think of anybody else that does that. And then he said, I, let me ask you a third question. He said, if I'm just going to go, if I were to pick a few families out of your church or pick every family out of your church and I were to go to their house, it doesn't have to be announced. I don't have to knock on their door. He says, I'm just going to go to the neighbor next to them on the right and no, the neighbor next to them on the left. And I'm going to knock on their door and I'm going to say, did you know that next to you is living a Christian? 
Did you know a Christian lives next to you? A Christian that believes that they're going to heaven and you, if you're not saved, are going to go to hell? Do you know that there's somebody next to you that calls themselves a Christian? He said, how many people in your church would have a neighbor that would know that the person next to them is a Christian? Not just, I, I'm not talking about, you know, preaching to them. I'm just saying they know that they have a Christian influence. And the pastor said, well, I don't, we don't really talk to our neighbors anymore. I mean, nobody talks to neighbors anymore. And, and, and the pastor friend of mine said, it's no wonder that God is not working. I tell you tonight, it'd be easy for us to hang it up and say, you know what, we just don't see people getting saved like we used to, and people just aren't doing, responding to the Lord, and the times are bad, and I would agree that times are bad, I would agree that the world is dark, I would agree that there is so much sin in the world, but I disagree that God will not save souls. And I do believe tonight that it's not the gospel's fault. If we're going to point the blame, it has to be pointed right at us. How many times have I been without a track? How many times have I gotten into my day and not prayed, Lord, would you give me boldness that I may preach the gospel with boldness today? How many times do I fail to be a testimony just in my realm of influence around me? See, the problem is not the gospel. The problem is not the darkness of the world. The problem is the silence of the witness. And I believe tonight, if we're going to see God work, I, I'm not, there's no guilt trip. I just think we, there's a lot to do. We have not plumbed the depths. We've not fished this ocean dry. God has a lot more for us to harvest if we're willing to put our mind to it. All I'm doing is just saying, can we just have a mind to say, Lord, I want to labor for you this year that I may be well-pleasing. Whether absent from the body with you in heaven or whether I'm here, I want to be well-pleasing to you. So church, that's really my heart tonight. These are just strategies to get to the same goal. They're just a structure that helps us to attain what God wants us to get to. And I'm asking, number one, for your prayer. Lord, would you just help us in this? Would you, would you help us to commit to this? Would you help me? And then number two, I'm asking for your participation. And I know we're worked. Many of us are doing many things. I understand that. And I'm not trying to overwork. I'm saying uh, if there's something that God can specifically lead you to, would you be willing to say, Lord, I'll do it? And I believe that's where God can help us. I'm looking forward to this year, aren't you? Amen. I think there's great things. I'll say it again. I'll say it before. I said it, I've said it before. I'll say it again. That the future this year is as bright as God's promises. And we can trust him for that. Amen. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes tonight. Lord, I thank you tonight for the motives that you've shown to us why we need to labor to please you. Lord, I'm thankful tonight that we're accepted in salvation, but I'm also thankful that we can know how to please you. Help us, I pray, that we might give these decisions true and intense thought that we might be found approved and accepted. Lord, we thank you tonight for your goodness. Bless in the decisions that will be made. I pray that we might commit ourselves once again. Perhaps there's someone here that just needs to say, Lord, you have me, heart and mind and body. And I, I will give you my all. I surrender to you tonight. What a tremendous opportunity this first night of the year to give ourselves to you like that. Maybe there's an adult that's never really come to that place of complete surrender. Maybe there's a young person. Lord, maybe we need to confess our apathy or our pride. Oh, Lord, I pray that you'd help us tonight to do our business with you. That we might walk from here pure and clean, not burdened by our guilt or sin looking forward to what you have for us. Lord, may we become involved, I pray, not just for the sake of activity, not just to push this thing along. Lord, you're the engine. You don't need pushed. But we need to be participating that we might be able to see you bless and become fruitful in our hands. We pray that you do your work now in Christ's name. Amen. Please join me standing. The invitation is extended tonight. Would you do business with the Lord tonight as he's called and dealt with our hearts? Thank you.